Hey guys, this is Dr. Bertolo Meshko, the medical futurist, and welcome to the second public live Q&A of the medical futurist. Uh, I hope you will have a good time. Um, I will, because we will talk about one of my favorite topics ever, using digital health technologies, devices, gadgets, and smartwatches and fitness trackers for improving one's health and, and doing one's health management to have a chance for a long and um, healthy life. Um, you can ask questions live and please do ask questions live. If I cannot answer one question, I will try to make sure I will answer those questions after the live is over. Last time there were about 300 questions. I couldn't answer all of them, but I will do my best to do that this time. Um, usually we would meet on a stage in a medical conference, in an event or in a meetup, but now we meet in my home. So welcome to my home, uh, Baby Yoda also welcomes you here. Um, I hope that you feel that you can ask freely about anything that comes to your mind that interests you about using digital health gadgets. That's quite a controversial topic as now tens of millions of people use these health and fitness trackers, but I wouldn't say that tens of millions of them are satisfied with what they get by using these technologies. So, so let's talk about all these. I will try to watch both YouTube Live and Facebook Live at the same time and answer any questions that you might have. Um, thank you so much for those uh, saying hi from all over the world, from Singapore, from Budapest, Hungary, Canada, the US, uh, from San Francisco to Colorado and India, uh, Johannesburg in South Africa. So welcome to everyone. And um, well, let's jump into it. Uh, I didn't start this when digital health got really famous a few years ago. I started tracking my health where in 1997 when I was 13 years old. Uh, I didn't use a gadget. I used a, a paper and a pen and I started giving a score between 1 and 10 to my mental, emotional and physical health. Basically, my, my idea was that if I give a score about my physical health regarding how healthy I feel to my mental health, how focused I can be on that day, and to my emotional health, meaning how happy I am, then after a few days or weeks, I would see the algorithm um, I live by. And I did. After about two weeks, I saw that if I can exercise almost every day, then I can focus better, I can do my job better, I can learn better every day. And if I can do that on the long term, I, in general, become happier. Of course, I'm not that simple, but this algorithm that, that my life is based around is indeed that simple. And when the first devices uh, became accessible in the early 2010s, I started using all of them to find out which one is useful, which one isn't. And I plan to show you plenty of these gadgets, even going through a sort of evolution the digital health trackers have gone through. But let's start with a few questions that uh, some of you sent me before and some that you asked already. Um, and I will try to copy all the questions into this box so you can see it yourself, like now. So the first question is what, uh, it's either Juster asked the question, what can we do now that will move us into a future we want, but not lock us into the future we are creating? Um, I always quite to refer to what the, the work futurists do in a way that it's not that we are trying to predict the future per se, but we're trying to find out the desirable future scenarios. And our job, my job, is not to predict what's going to happen. My job is to find out what, what's the best that could happen and then what's missing between the two scenarios. What's, what are the gaps between what is possible today and what could become possible tomorrow? So I think what can move us into the future is, is playing with the what if question a bit more often, feeling like instead of daydreaming, what I do is I play with the what if question. What if this new technology I just read about becomes an amazing thing? What if that technology that is used for contact tracing during the pandemic can lead to a dystopic privacy nightmare? And by playing with the what if question, I think we gradually create a future which is really desirable and which we would love to see in action. So thank you, Ivor, for the question. Um, here is a second question. By time, I will get a bit faster about this, so please bear with me. 
can a patient monetize his or her data? That's a very good question because there are some startups that try to, to build a business model up on this, but it's not as easy as it may sound. I, I, I know that I have a lot of data, much more than average patients have, because I use these gadgets, which I will talk about in a minute, but I'm not sure how I could monetize that data. I'm sure that those companies, some of them monetize my data, even though I specifically said that I don't want them to sell my data to third parties, because I think many of them, even companies doing genetic testing are selling my data to the third parties in an anonymized way, even when it's not possible, theoretically. Uh, but I cannot monetize it myself. What might be different though, is when we look at clinical trials and how those trials are organized, I think in that case, it's possible to do that. Uh, as far as I know, companies like clinical, like trial reach have been trying to do, to make it happen that they, they involve patients. They try to make patients active in clinical trials. And by this, they can share data about symptoms. They can fill in questionnaires or even share the data coming from their trackers and they can literally sell this data to the third parties, usually pharma companies that want to buy such data. So while it's a, it's a very good question, I think it's a viable business model. I haven't seen this happening um, that massively yet. Wow, questions are coming in and we might not even have some time to, to go into the gadgets, but uh, well, we, will, we will. Here is another great question from Amaninder Dillon. It's about how to integrate various digital health platforms into one dashboard so that people can manage health as they as they manage their finance. And uh, there's a typo and I just can't answer the question until I make that change. Now it's fine. It's again a valid question. Uh, I think the, the reason why I don't see many startups trying to tackle this is that it's a mission impossible. There was one startup a few years back called exist.io and what they tried to do is that they asked our, uh, my permission to get access to the data coming from my fitness trackers, smartwatches, health trackers, apps and so on, even sleep quality and based on that they would give me recommendations and I remember that after about two weeks of streaming my data to them which is a privacy nightmare enough alone but I wanted to get some you know interesting insights about my health they send me back like a conclusion that um, I spend more time exercising when I take when I have more steps a day, which is obviously a physical fact, but that's the kind of conclusion they could come up with. I think back then, machine learning algorithms were not involved that much in such in analyzing such data, but maybe now that's the kind of platform that we are looking forward to seeing in action, where a machine learning algorithm analyzes all my data. And based on real life examples, trying to give me insightful ideas, suggestions about what I should do next. Some companies like Fitbit and their devices do that through the app, but you know, these are quite regular general recommendations. Like um, I would sleep better if I went to sleep earlier, stuff like that, which you can even get from a, a health fitness um, top 10 tips on buzzfeed.com. So it's not really useful, but I, I'm, I have no doubt that such platforms will be in the future, will be, will exist in the future, but we, I don't even see um, the, the first steps uh, taken in that direction. Um, okay, before diving through the, the remaining questions, and thank you so much for, for getting these questions flowing in. I, I love that and I will get back to as, as much as I can. Plus, Krista, our social media manager, is right there with you in the comment section, giving you links to the articles and analysis we have published already, if, it, if it's an answer for your question. So be with us in the moment. Um, Hemon Bankide has a question on Facebook Live about what are, where are the, the technologies available for COVID-19? And um, I think there are many technologies being used for fighting against the pandemic, plus many technologies had to come to the spotlight during the pandemic. Telemedicine is becoming the new norm because otherwise there is such a risk for the exposure to infections that, that physicians and patients worldwide have to use 
telemedicine, even though they are rejecting it or they, they used to reject it in the first place, but now they have to be open to that. We see disinfecting robots in hospitals roaming around hospital rooms around the world. We see artificial intelligence being used to predict the next outbreaks, like how the first outbreak in Wuhan was predicted by a Canadian AI startup. So we are seeing some good technologies um, coming through in the light of the pandemic. But let's dive into the topic we have for today, because you can't see that, but I have a myriad of gadgets on my table, and that's like 10% of what I have tested already. I've tested around 150-ish uh, digital health gadgets, and um, I can say I have pretty good experience using them. I'm quite fed up with many of them, and I, I have nightmares about some of the features. I think I had one of the first Fitbits ever. This tiny thing was, was the first Fitbit. I got it at uh, Singularity University back in 2012. Uh, that was the first, I think, digital health gadgets I started using on a daily basis. And you had to wear it on your belt in a tiny pocket. Um, that was a fun experience and I could see my the number of steps I had a day, uh, calories I burned, how many stairs I took a day, you know, regular stuff that you see on fitness trackers and smartwatches every day uh, these days. But it was a good start. And I think I went through a whole evolution of fitness trackers with Fitbit. It, it was, I think, one of the first ones I, I used for the longest time, like more than a year. But then I had some issues, uh, hardware issues uh, with the smartwatch. And I sent Fitbit a, a support with an image that it, it just broke. So I got a new one. That was my third Fitbit smartwatch, the, the Blaze. The other one was a Surge. And now I have the, the Fitbit Ionic, which um, I've been using for three years now. Literally, it's on my wrist day and night. Um, I think it has been the most useful fitness watch I ever used. But the, really, the real turning point for me was when they introduced the smart sleep alarm. So you guys, if you are thinking about using a fitness tracker in the future, or you, you can decide, or you have been thinking about this, the smart sleep alarm is the only feature that will change your mind. They change your life, not just your mind. The smart sleep alarm is the, I call it the holy grail of health tracking. So in, in most Fitbit watches since mid last year, uh, they have now this smart alarm. I guess you can see it in a mirrored way. So I just click on it. Um, I, I describe how it works. With the smart alarm, I can tell the watch, like I give you 20 minutes in the morning between 6 and 6, 6 20 a.m. like I did this morning. And in those 20 minutes, let's find the spot when I'm in light sleep. So with one gentle vibration, the watch can wake me up quite easily. Uh, you know what I'm talking about. When you wake up feeling that the world is over and you need five cups of coffee, that means that it's not just that you didn't want to wake up, it's that you woke up in deep sleep. But waking up in light sleep is a different word. I feel energized and I can just start the day right off. The difference could be two minutes, but you cannot tell because you're asleep. A smartwatch can. You have to wear it on your non-active arm. I'm right-handed, so it's on my left arm. And I can move around. And while being asleep, I get sleep activity details. And in the morning, it finds the best spot to wake me up. Um, I want to show you a, an example here. Like one of the original fitness tracker, Fitbit trackers, had sleep quality analysis like this one. What you can see here is the orange uh, part represents the time when you are still awake. The light blue part stands for light sleep and the deep blue part stands for deep sleep. And um, the newest watches, uh, watches can even show you the REM phases and a bit more details, but that's the general idea of sleep tracking. And that's what you get when you use a fitness tracker for sleep tracking. But I want to show you a different picture, uh, this one which I used when I when, when the Fitbit smartwatch didn't have the smart sleep alarm. So I used the Sleep as Android smartwatch app. It was just an application, nothing else. But by being connected to my smartwatch, it could still um, track the activity and, and have the smart alarm function. It, it has a bit more details. Here you see my movements, and here is the, the same kind of analysis we just saw with the Fitbit smartwatch. I could give a score to my sleep quality in the morning. It told me you know, how many deep sleep cycles I had, for how long, for how long I slept, how much time I spent snoring. 
and stuff like that. And later I started using gadgets which could measure oxygen saturation as well, like um, the, the smartwatch-like device from Viatom. And they showed me the, the percentage of blood oxygen levels in my, in my blood. And it has to be, you know, around 95% in normal ways. But if you snore, if you have sleep apnea, the sleep conditions, then it can go below 90. So it seems, seems that time I had some snoring issues that I could so that I could see in the data as well. And the last thing here, I, I kept on comparing results. Like in this case, I used a, a smartwatch with an oxygen saturation function. On the right, I just used the app, the Sleep as Android app. And as you can see, it's quite similar the way how these these curves, uh, what these curves look like on both figures. And um, after some time, I felt like, of course, these sleep quality trackers cannot be perfect, but they are good enough for me to to help me wake up uh, in the best at the best time in the morning. The smartwatch I just mentioned was this one from Viatom. I'm not saying that it was comfortable wearing it like this on my index finger, so it could measure my blood oxygen levels. But for those who who have to face sleep conditions like sleep, sleep apnea, it can be really exciting. So that's the kind of evolution I've seen with Fitbits. And um, I still stick to them, even though after last year, they were acquired by Google. And I have now doubts about how my data would get used by Google, how they might sell it. There's an, there was a news article today about the kind of uh, battle, legal battle uh, Google is having right now in European courts about that they have to promise that they won't use the data coming from Fibi trackers. But again, we users have doubts about that. Let's look at some questions. Again, I guess, thank you so much for, for, for the questions. I love that they are keep coming in. Um, here is one from Istvan Nadai. I just want to show you the question. It might be too long, so you might not be able to see the whole thing, but now you will see. Oh, you can see that. That is the Ura Ring, and that is Freestyle Libre, but I think they are mostly used in the US. Would you be able to suggest any alternative devices for them here in Europe or in Hungary? That's a perfect question because there are, there are so many logistical issues around these devices. The, the price is falling down, the quality is rising up, everything is getting better. But depending on which country you live in, you might not get access to them still, even though Fitbit has tens of millions of users. So what I haven't, I haven't tested the Ura ring yet, because simply I can't imagine wearing a huge ring on my finger, a huge black ring on my finger all day long. It's just even wearing my engagement ring is a bit too much for me. So I, I don't think I could live with that like I could live with a smartwatch. For the Freestyle Libre, this is a, a contactless, uh, it's a wireless, not contactless, a wireless blood glucose monitoring system, like a patch with a tiny needle uh, below your skin, just really a, a low level below your skin. And it can connect, it can be connected to your smartphone and it measures blood glucose all day long. I will test it in a month or so. I got some promises from a new startup uh, using that device. But regarding alternatives for the ring, I haven't seen one. Only smartwatches, obviously, um, but none of them measures body temperature like the Ura Ring does. I think that's that's a unique feature they have. And for a Freestyle Libre uh, device, uh, I haven't seen a good alternative either. Only closed bionic uh, glucose systems, uh, blood glucose systems, but only in the US. Uh, but again, when I start experimenting with the Freestyle Libre system, I guess I will have a better oversight about what other devices exist out there uh, for European markets in, in uh, determining blood glucose levels. There's a question coming over about detecting depression, which these are a question I'm, I'm always scared about because um, they are not really about technologies. We could talk about biomarkers for detecting early signs of depression, but I'm, I'm, my field of interest is, is around digital health technologies. And uh, I haven't seen a good technology being able to detect such signs unless I think about these startups that used machine learning based algorithms to analyze the voice recordings, actually phone calls of elderly patients looking for early signs of Alzheimer's disease. But that's not depression. So um, regarding depression, I guess a similar method could be used to look for unique features or patterns in the, the voice recordings of patients. 
but imagine that that you would know that an algorithm is listening into your conversations just for the sake of detecting early signs of depression. Every part of this story sounds really bad to me. So I'm not sure if, if that's going to happen without the opt-in approach of patients willingly sharing their voice recording voice recordings for, for looking for such patterns. But, you know, patient with severe depression will not look for using such a device to input data and, and to share their own voice recordings. So it's a, it's a difficult issue. Um, wow, I, I love this question. Let me share that with you. It's coming from, it's coming from Umberto Moromizato. Do you believe in the tendency, do you believe the tendency on software solutions instead of devices? I believe almost both in both, but somewhere in middle that I'm, I love the, the uh, the approach that, for example, Tesla uh, has in making electronic cars, that they do make a hardware and sell it to the customer, but then based on software updates, why the, the I almost said patient, why the customer is, is asleep, the car is, is getting new features because the hardware is good enough, like a good buffer that can welcome new innovations through software. And I love that kind of approach. I think Fitbit and Apple Watch they have similar similar features that with the updates coming in the near future, these could have um, new software-based features with the same hardware. So I guess that's the exciting um, side for me when looking at this uh, software versus hardware debate. Oh, there is a great question from uh, Abel Kotona. Um, you poke the monster here. What's about nutrition trackers now and nutrigenomics? Uh, the reason why you poke the monster is because we plan to have a different public Q&A live about this and specifically about this topic because I have so many gadgets and technologies focusing on eating uh, food quality, food trackers, but I let me share some of them with you and I promise that we will have a different public live with live testing about these. He's, here are the NEMA food sensors with which I can tell if my food contains either gluten or peanut in about 30 seconds. And again, we will test food live that time. I have a sensor food marble that can tell me how I digest certain types of food like uh, fructose and lactose. And I can do tests about these in my home, like doing a lab test. There are smart forks and, and smart utensils. Like this smart fork uh, can teach you how to eat more slowly like when you start eating faster it starts vibrating in your hand and it, it it means that let's you know cool down and and um and be a bit slower while eating because we we have it's it measures the number of fork servings uh we have during meals uh i tried it a few times and it's really it's a it's a nightmare experience first finding out how fast i eat plus having this um this anxiety that I can't eat my meal properly because this technology is telling me what to do. So we will talk about these at a different time because nutrigenomics is, is very close to my heart. And this is a topic that really has to have its own public life Q&A. So thank you for the question. We will cover it later. I, I wanted to show you a few gadgets. So uh, before diving into the remaining questions, uh, let me go through with a different type of trackers, um, tricoders. Uh, if you watched Star Trek, you know that Dr. McCoy used a, a little device with which Dr. McCoy could check the patient's vital signs and health parameters just by scanning the patient like this. And it told him the, you know, these basic vital signs and uh, the options about diagnosis and stuff like that, just like in a science fiction movie, literally. And the first time I came across this device, the Viatom Check Me Pro, I felt the same that with this device in actually about 30 seconds by holding it like like this. No, like this. I can do a daily check and it does an ECG, a one channel ECG. It checks my, my body temperature and my oxygen saturation plus my heart rate um, and breathing rate at the same time. And at the end, it gives me analysis. I will show it to you in a second. I have, my pulse is 91, I'm nervous. Uh, to go through all these technologies. My blood oxygen level is 95%. And at the end, I get 
two analyses, one for my heart rate and, and oxygen saturation, and one for my ECG, and both are smileys, which means I won't die in the next couple of hours. I told the company that giving smileys for assessing ECGs is a tricky thing to do, but we understand what's going on even without the, the knowledge about understanding ECGs in details. And for body temperature, I think it works like that. It's 36.1 Celsius. I'm I, sorry, I don't know it in Fahrenheit, <laughs> but it's 36.1 Celsius. So again, I'm fine. Um, I Once I, I showed it to um, um, emergency medicine physicians in an ambulance and they were astonished how fast it is, how good the assessment is. Plus they can dive into the details of the ECG with two clicks and they can, they can analyze the ECG themselves without the algorithm analyzing that. So for me, that was the first medical tricorder experience. There's a similar one from a Hungarian company called Vive. It works the same way. I open the app, I hold this business card type device like this, and it uh, analyzes my ECG, my heart rate, and it goes into even more details to detect uh, atrial fibrillation, which is a kind of a sign for a risk for stroke. Uh, therefore, it's it's a really important device. And um, in my experience, the battery life is amazing. The analysis is easily understandable and everything is on the app. So I can just share it with my primary care physician. For, for using these, I think even after using these, I might only have a chance for a longer and healthier life, but no more. And for this, I have to be a geek who can solve technological issues. I mean, Bluetooth connections and pairing the... 30 second device, all these is, is really awful, but I can deal with those. I am a medical professional, so I can analyze some of the data. Uh, plus, um, I have a great primary care physician, Dr. Reka Vernes, who is a partner with me in this crime of using digital health devices. And I think these three things are needed for me to get the most out of these. But in an ideal way, the technology should be ready and able to work with anyone without any geek background and solving technological issues. But with Bluetooth and everything, we are still uh, far from that. Oh, there's a great question from Maria Midlares. It's a good provocative question. Please send, keep sending these questions. I, I love some provocation. I like to provide some myself. Do you think the accuracy of these devices is high enough to make a diagnosis in hospital circumstances? It's a good question and, and fortunately it doesn't have to be me who assesses the quality of the accuracy of these devices, but there are certain thresholds. Most of these devices are CE marked, so at least we know that they won't blow up uh, in my hand. But some of them are even FDA approved, meaning that, which is quite a high threshold, the FDA approval means that these devices can be used in, healthcare, in the healthcare setting under medical circumstances. And as far as I know, uh, some ECGs I will show in a minute, the, the Viatom Check Me Pro and some other devices that I will show later are FDA approved, but Fitbit devices are, for example, not because they know that it would be a nightmare for them to go through the FDA approval process. And whenever they have a software update and any hardware updates, it's going to be even worse. So uh, they, I don't think they don't think they would do that. But having a device FDA approved, I think it means that it could be used um, in a hospital setting. And as there are studies about some of these devices, medical professionals can, can have the chance to reach out to those studies and, and see the evidence themselves and decide themselves if, if they are uh, if the evidence is strong enough for them to use these devices. I think the best way would be for medical associations to help assess the quality and accuracy of these devices. So that the answer is in some cases with FDA approvals, for example, the answer is yes. Um, wow, another quite provocative question, which uh, came from Laurent Mignot. Hi, Laurent. Uh, would you be comfortable having an AI make health decisions for you based on what your data say, or you would rather listen to a single doctor? <laughs> you will hate me for the answer, but the, the ideal scenario is literally both. I don't want my physician, especially when it comes to making a really hard decision, like a diagnosis of cancer or a serious chronic condition. I don't want my medical professional to have the pressure to, to make the decision alone by him or herself. 
I literally, I really definitely don't want an AI making the decision by itself because the way I, I live my lifestyle, the way I describe my symptoms, all these are so important in making the final decision. Plus, medicine is not a linear process like in a factory that you, if you measure all my data, you do a whole body MRI, you will know everything about me. That's not, unfortunately, that's not how medicine works. But instead, instead, all the things that we can obtain data-wise, question-wise, image-wise about the patient, and using that data and, and mining medical records and the 30x million medical papers and studies out there, an AI could help find things that the doctors didn't have in mind while making the diagnosis or, or just pointing out studies that they should keep in mind. I want them both to be involved in making that decision and even more, I want myself to be involved because I'm pretty sure they cannot make a decision over my head, over my shoulders about my health and disease management without actively involving me. I'm a resource and patients are the most underused resources in healthcare. So that's the kind of ideal vision I have in mind about using AI for these purposes. Oh, uh, there is another question. You don't let me test my... and and these devices lie because you are so amazing questions. And of course, thank you for those. What is liability if the devices make a mistake in a diagnosis? Excellent question. And it comes up so many times in, in medical, during medical discussions. I think the answer is easy. When a doctor makes a diagnosis, like they do millions of times, even today, and they use a stethoscope to, to listen to cardiac and lung sounds on a patient, and doctor makes a wrong diagnosis based on what he or she thinks uh, they thought they heard with the stethoscope, but the stethoscope had a, has a had a hardware issue. Uh, it was a faulty device, and that's how they made the wrong diagnosis. Nobody thinks that the stethoscope's manufacturer would be liable for making that diagnosis. Unfortunately, it's still the medical professional at the end of the decision making process who has the liability. I think the same will stand for AI-based algorithms, for advanced technologies and portable ultrasound devices, but only if physician or medical professionals use these devices as, are, as these are described in the official documents of these technologies. If they are used in a different way, then of course, that's a different scenario. If they use the device in the right way and the device gives a wrong result, then the device is manufacturer. Will, will be held liable for what happened. Because even that's the, the kind of uh, model that they use these days in legal battles um, without AI-based algorithms, just by using stethoscopes and radiology machines and general medical technologies. So I think the, it, uh, the notion will remain the same, but of course with, with more advanced things like AI, it's gonna be a bit more complicated, but again, the, the same uh, method will be used. Um, okay, before going through the questions and, and thank you so much for, for being us, being with us here today. I'm, I'm so glad that you're coming from so many countries around the world. Um, it's really great that, uh, please, and you have a great, I'm, I'm seeing that you have a great discussion, even among yourself, please keep the questions coming and I will try to address, uh, everything. There is one, uh, question from Judith on Facebook live about, uh, what Fitbit or smart alarm I would recommend for kids. I, I have a three and a half years old daughter, so you can imagine that I've been trying to find a good device for her, but there is none. There are some smartwatches made for kids from six or five or six, and I, and I got one from my niece, but uh, she didn't use it for long, and it was not as useful as I, I, saw, I thought it would be. So I'm afraid for kids, we have to keep on waiting for a good device to come. All right, the next one is, is one of my favorite ones. And I just to make sure uh, we never accept sponsorships for any reviews we do, do on the Medical Futurist channels. And I, I don't have stock, unfortunately, in any of these companies, but I have a favorite one. I do have a favorite one and it's a life core now called Cardia because they, they were the first company back in 2013, which I saw a real digital health based device, a technology that brought something that was only that, that only used to be accessible within the healthcare setting and it brought the data out to make it available to both patients and medical professionals and now you know that this is the essence of digital health that the data these technologies bring over 
can be accessible to both patients and medical professionals. And I used this smartphone bracket that, that time. It was it only worked with iPhones back then. I had to put the iPhone inside, and by holding the iPhone like this with the app running, I did a one-channel ECG. Uh, my mind was blown away that wow, this is really amazing. That, that time I I finished medical school just two years before, and I remember clearly that I had to walk around with these huge carts you know, bringing that, that huge ECG machine around in the clinic and doing ECG on patients with so many electrodes. And then I got the paper, the result on a paper. And then this thing just gave me, not the same, not a, not a 12 channel, but a one channel ECG uh, looking for atrial fibrillation, detecting, de de detecting AFib in about 30 or 60 seconds. And I got the results in a PDF. I could share it with my medical professional or my peers. It was mind blowing for me that this is the the reason why digital health is going to have an amazing future. And later they, they kept on having an evolution of hardware devices and all even software. Then they had this iteration, uh, you know, it was smaller, thinner. Uh, and then they had this one, even smaller, even thinner. And by putting my two fingers here, I can just do an ECG in 30 seconds. And um, I, actually I can do that. And hopefully we won't detect anything strange uh, in my ECG. You won't be able to see that, but you will see the results when I'm done. So I open up the Cardia application. I put down the device. I should like hold it, keep it together. I shouldn't be nervous. I put my two fingers on the device and I show the, I see the recording right away uh, with my heart rate and everything. Oh, it's vice versa. Now it's okay. My heart rate is 85, so I'm, I'm getting calmer as the time goes on during the live. And I will show you in 20 seconds the results of my ECG. I shouldn't be talking, obviously. I should have washed my hands before that, but now we don't do these things. Just I just wanted to give you a gist of how ECG recordings work. So um, bear with me for seven more seconds, and I will show you my hopefully positive, I mean negative ECG result. And now it's done. It's processing the file. And it says I had no ab abnormalities detected in my ECG. You, I guess you, okay, you can see that, but maybe right now you can see the ECG on the top and the, here's, here are the results. And uh, it seems I don't have AFib and I'm fine. Actually, once a month or so, I do an ECG just in case without any healthcare risks. That I have, and we can talk about genetic risks uh, in a later public Q and A live. That's another favorite topic of mine. Let's check out some other uh, questions and comments. Um, wow, you have some amazing questions going on. Um, Amaninder Dillon had a question about a really important topic, which. I don't like that much because there is no good answer for this. How do you ensure that the digital devices are secure of data theft? You cannot be. It's it's every time I buy a technology that might facilitate my health or disease management, I make a decision. How much of my privacy I'm willing to give up in exchange for a chance for a longer and healthier life because of using that technology, that device. Every time I feel like I'm the one making that decision, as long as it as long as, as that's the case, ethically I should be fine. I told many of these companies not to share my data, as I described before. I'm sure some of them did or have. I'm sure Fitbit is using my data. I'm sure Google is going to use my data coming from Fitbit trackers because now they own the Fitbit, all the Fitbit hardware and software. So um while I would love to give you a good answer that you can do this or that to make sure. You cannot. Obviously, if you buy a device that's very cheap, like when I when I purchased the uh, fitness tracker from China, I don't even know the the brand name of this, and I started using it and compared the results, like heart rate and 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 fitness tracker, the exercise tracking and stuff like that, and I measured it with three sensors on me: a polar uh, chest device, my Fitbit, and this one. This one was vastly different from the others. The others could, could were, were comparable. So if you buy something that's cheap, there is a reason why it's that cheaper. Uh, Fitbit cannot make their devices 
much more expensive than the competitors just because they are Fitbit and it's a brand. Maybe Apple can do that with the Apple Watch, but, but none of the others. So I think there's a reason why these devices are so cheap and I would not trust these devices with my data. I might trust a few major brands with my data and I'm very cautious about smart, uh, smaller uh, startups and smaller companies. So thank you for the question. Um, uh, Humberto just asked about the, the smart fork, which we will cover next time. It's called Happy Fork, H-I-P-I, -I, happy with one P, happy fork. It's a French company and they're, they're still doing this. So it's worth checking them out. Uh, whew, wow, many questions are coming in. Thank you so much for those. Adam Nasser asks about um, human brain, brain machine interfaces. Um, I would love to see good devices in this, like Neuralink. I'm, I'm can't, I can't wait to see what they come up with. But all the devices I, I've used before for at least even EEG measure, EEG tracking, uh, electronic encephalogram tracking, like brain wave tracking, uh, more or less like the Muse device, and uh, I have now the Brain Link and some others that that are designed to help you meditate better. I, I had a hard time because the signal strength is very weak, and even if you blink the strength goes right down uh, and you, can, it, it, you can't even continue doing the meditation session. So if I blink, then imagine how I could use these sensors for, during exercises or running sessions or by working when I have to blink so much and I look at my two monitors and everything else. So I would love to see such devices, but I haven't even seen basic ones used for meditation that are reliable enough about sing signal strength that we could use them for really important purposes. For meditation tracking, you know, it's fun. I'm, I'm not lying to you. I, I think Muse helped me meditate better. I think with Muse, I, I started listening to my inner self, but I couldn't reach mindfulness. I couldn't try to reach mindfulness with a gadget on my head while meditating. So of course, after about six months, I stopped using it and I, I kept on meditating uh, for some time. But otherwise, I, I haven't seen really good uh, brain computer interfaces. The one that was very fun to use was made by Neurosky. It was a similar EEG device. And when I reached a certain threshold or level of focus, and I did that by counting back from 500 by 13 very fast, uh, I could start a drone flying around. Um, it's, it's in one of my blooper videos on YouTube. It's not that easy, but it looks fun. It's like a circus. My medical students love that when I showed it to them uh, during a lecture. So thank you for the question. Um, wow, what a nice question coming from Dave. So there seems to be a lot of devices being developed for adults and that is great, but will these devices eventually be modified for pediatrics? It's a good question because there would be a clear need, not just business thing, but even medical need and patient need for using such devices as patches, wearable sensors, smartwatches for kids, mostly for kids with a disease that they need to manage. I, the only good idea that comes to my mind is when the Austrian company MySugar made their diabetes tracker application available to kids and they, they redesigned everything around kids and they could tame a monster by by doing their disease management properly and it was a brilliant idea i guess that's why a pharma company acquired them about two years ago but otherwise uh, i'm not sure if just reiterating redesigning trackers made for adults could be used for kids i'm afraid really startups and companies have to be dedicated entirely to designing the health sensors for kids otherwise they wouldn't be able to to bridge that gap between what an adult body lifestyle entail and you know what could be what could work for kids and uh, I, I we still have to wait to see any startup coming up solutions in that space maybe for baby tracking there are some some promising uh, technologies out there but even when my, my daughter was uh, a few months old I couldn't find one single tracker that would be reliable enough and useful enough that uh, I would be comfortable um, her wearing that all day long. So um, yeah, we still have to wait for that. I think um, I, I, 
I had I missed some questions before. I'm trying to go back, and uh, please keep the questions coming. I'm trying to answer as many as I can. As we only have about 15 minutes left, I will now try to give you with shorter answers. Here's another question from Jean-François Pain. What is your point of view on digital biomarkers? Who are the big players in this field? Well, digital biomarkers, you know, for those who don't who are not familiar with biomarkers, biomarkers like uh, uh, blood markers and, and hormone levels, many things that can be used during, for example, a clinical trial that can provide data about the response to certain medications or certain treatments. And digital biomarkers uh, exist when you can do the same, but without the patients going to a lab, to having a blood test done, but just them using a technology, a fitness tracker, for example, uh, wearing an Apple Watch that, that does an ECG every two hours or so. With these, clinical trials can, can be lie. I mean, before, had many months had to, be, had to pass for for researchers to obtain the data on paper mostly and then analyze everything months later but now you can run clinical trials live why on an online dashboard you can see how your patients are doing in that clinical trial and how they are responding to the medication again real time it's mind-blowing and and i haven't seen good companies coming up with solutions with evidence behind them that is good enough but the the apple watch clinical trial with with tens of thousands of patients having an ECG functioning at Apple Watches in California is something that, that shows a promising future for digital biomarkers. Um, do you see, um, okay. Next question from Maria Midlares. Do you see a migration of medical grade devices to consumer rare devices? I would say yes. Um, technology-wise, but not system-wise. I mean, Cardia is the perfect example for an ECG, but as far as I know, in most cases, only medical professionals can, can get access to that. Only they can buy a device per se. And I see similar examples with many other medical tricoders and genetic tests and other devices. So while the technology is indeed available to patients, it, this, from the system perspective, those are not because a middleman, <laughs> a medical professional, is still needed to write a prescription and get those technologies. So while the quality of these devices get closer to medical grade, which we get access to, but still many, which would be useful for, for consumers, just don't reach the markets because of this notion that these could only be useful and available to medical professionals. Um... Oh, there is a good one from, wow, I can't even read the name out loud. Fluffil X, X Fluffil X. I did my best, sorry guys. And I have to ask, because that's a really important question, about how the majority of doctors are not familiar with digital health gadgets, data and how to use them. Exactly. And that's why we have to include um, this kind of skill set and digital literacy in the medical curriculum. That's why I teach medical students at, at my medical school, Semmelweis Medical School. That's why I launched and I made the curriculum I use for my medical students open access and a medical school in Turkey, one in the Czech Republic already had that course. So I, I, I hope uh, more schools will adopt the same curriculum for free in an open access way because we have to help physicians uh, get ahead of the digital curve. But the right approach, I think, what physicians need is the one that my primary care physician, Reiko Vernach, had when I asked her about one of my gadgets and the data I, I obtained and I was confused about the results I got. And then she asked, well, I don't know, but sit next to me and let's find out together. So we did some searches for the, on the company's website. We found out the issue and with her medical expertise and with my expertise about my own technologies, we found a solution. I think that's the, the, the eco-level partnership that can really facilitate not just the improvement of doctor-patient relationship, but also the use of these digital health devices. Um, wow, an excellent question is coming on about one of my favorite topics about bias in artificial intelligence. The question is coming from um, Fabian Bergons about skin vision. It's an app with which you can do a, a photo of your skin vision and they in using algorithms they detect if it has a it's a risk of becoming a suspicious suspicious lesion. 
and then it can be checked out by a physician uh, dermatologist remotely. Most of the skin lesions uh, algorithms have bias, mainly of being from fair light skin color, or I guess being tested on, on uh, white uh, Caucasian people. How could we trust them? Excellent question. You couldn't until they prove otherwise. They have to have enough evidence behind them, no matter what the company says, no matter what kind of marketing text they have. We need studies and independent studies not sponsored by those companies that, that were tested on, on patients with a whole range of skin colors, making sure that bias should not be a part of how the artificial intelligence-based algorithm makes a decision about the risk of a suspicious lesion. Because in some, some cases in dermatology about skin cancer, it can be a life and death decision. So we, they need to make sure and they have to provide evidence for us to use the, the application or a device uh, reliably and comfortably. Um, <laughs> there's a good one coming from, uh, I will see who is asking the question in a second. Catherine Winkler, thank you for the question. What will it take for investors to be more comfortable with digital health device investment? Couple of things. Uh, we shouldn't have examples like Theranos that brought investors to the ground, to their, to, their, to, their, to their knees for months, if not years. So we have to avoid scams like that. If it was not about a tech, it was a scam, purely a scam. We have to have a clear understanding of what's going on in healthcare. And digital health is not a technological revolution, but a cultural transformation. So the way these technologies impact the doctor-patient relationship is simply more substantial, more important than, than which microchip comes out next year. Third, um, companies should have should be able to provide enough medical scientific evidence so investor so investors could be more confident about how the medical society and com community would react to these new technologies. Even if you have the world's best medical technology coming up, you just invented it. It will change the world but you don't have evidence behind that, no one can and no one should use your innovation. So as, as soon as these companies understand and mostly tech giants coming, coming up with such technologies understand and embrace this concept that they have to provide medical evidence in peer-reviewed studies, then the investors will have a, a better chance of, um, of finding those that they can trust because consumers and medical professionals will trust those medical technologies. Oh. There is a great question coming from Roshan Khan. And this question just warms my heart. It's about how can I be more closely related to the medical futurists more than just subscribing to a newsletter and free webinars? Thank you for asking that. We, we publish everything for free on YouTube, on social media, analysis, uh, a lot of, we, we publish many eBooks for free. And then on the second level, we have eBooks, um, like executive summaries about exciting topics like AI's role in the future of healthcare, future of pharma, tech giants in healthcare. But I think the best way you can get more um, closely related to what we do at The Medical Futurist is by becoming a patron on patreon.com slash The Medical Futurist, where we, we publish different analysis, we publish early access content and stuff nobody else can see, only the patrons. Now we have almost 200 patrons uh, interacting with us every day and these are really amazing people from innovators to uh, business leaders and, and government officials from literally around the world and we enjoy i enjoy personally interact, interacting with them every single day so by becoming a patron you would get content that we we, we don't publish anywhere else and even they get live q a's not publicly but just for them where i really make sure that i answer all the questions they have so please check out patreon.com slash the medical futurist and and join the community that we are building there. Um, I think we have question for about one, maybe one or two. Well, we have time for about one or two questions. I'm checking out the uh, Facebook live. Irene Cantor is asking about Baby Yoda. Uh, I got Baby Yoda for Father's Day for my daughter. I guess my my wife ordered it from um, from the company that's making Star Wars. I'm not gonna say their say their name out because I'm mad at them or pulling Star Wars. I'm doing Star Wars the way they do. Um, so it's an original Baby Yoda and we live quite happily. Uh, we have been living quite happily since I got it. 
from them. Um, so again, maybe one or two questions. Um, wow, uh, I'm trying to answer the questions of those who I haven't answered any questions of yet. Here is one from Satovic. It's a bit long question, so I'm not sure if you will see that, but let me do my best here. So five years from now, what type of devices will make up the affordable and mass market kit that will enable expanded telehealth evaluations for primary care? Excellent question. And I guess the question is not just for, for consumers, but for medical professionals, because for, I guess both, for both. But in a medical professional's bag, I can now put a lot of devices uh, for, a, I think for like a few hundred euros that would be able to replace a smaller hospital room. Um, ECGs, diagnostic devices, electronic uh, digital stethoscopes, which I didn't even, even have time to test, um, smartwatches, blood pressure devices like the Omron, which is a, a smartwatch blood pressure device, uh, portable ultrasound and so on. Uh, for that price, for consumers, it's a different thing because I'm not sure if you know everyone should have a kit at home. But if you have like eye problems from time to time, then maybe you want to get an IQ device because that's very cheap and it works with an application and it it tells you your your acuity and also color vision over time. Uh, so maybe for specific reasons in disease and health management, some of them could be useful. But I can't imagine that a kit would be sold to patients. There was there were some experiments about creating um, smartwatch brackets, like what Prisma G two did in Israel. Uh, with this, you can measure your blood oxygen levels, ECG, and many other things. But you know, a, a bracket is always different, and smartwatches, especially in size and shape, change so fast that you can't literally create one that would work with any other phone. So it's a tricky thing to do. But I guess for doctors, I can imagine such a kit being sold to them that time. Um, I think um, we we just run over time. It's um, one, one hour already. Um, I'm so uh, grateful to you all for being here. We will keep on having these live discussions. I very much enjoy them. And I hope you, you find, those, find these helpful as well. Um, we try to give you some links for some of the questions too. And I tried to answer about 80% of the questions uh, sent to me. And the plan is that next time we will have a live Q&A session about the future of food. I want to talk to you about, and I want you to see how food sensors work. I will test the gluten sensor, a peanut sensor in action. I will show you the smart utensils, and we will talk about nutrigenomics and why we don't have um, genetic-based applications and services that would help us find out what to eat. Because in 2020, I can measure my ECG, but I have no idea if I should eat this or that meal, if when I should eat and how I should eat it. So we will talk about it next time. And then we plan to have a session about portable ultrasound devices. Uh, this is the one I got from Clarius um, Mobile. And this is literally an ultrasound device. Don't look for the wires, there are none. I will do, any, I will do an ultrasound examination here. I will show you some of my arteries live. I, for me, it's a mind blowing experience having a that small ultrasound device in my hand, a working one through my smartphone. So every two weeks or so, we will keep on going through these topics uh, from artificial intelligence to 3D printing and, and many more. And please keep the questions coming. Please check out our analysis, our eBooks, our videos, everything we publish every day for free on medicalfuturist.com. And if you want to get some more um, about what we can produce content-wise, that we are building a community over patreon.com, as I mentioned before, on patreon.com slash the medical futurist. So please join us on all these channels. And I can't wait to see you in the next Q&A live session again. Thank you so much for your questions and see you next time. Bye.